That's terrifying. What is your original contribution of knowledge? Oh, uh, what is it? I don't know. Oh my god, I am sweating. Oh my god. Why was I under the impression that it would be like a five to ten minute chit chat? It was definitely not a chit chat. It was like. Good morning, friends. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Holly. I am a PhD student from Ireland. I was like, where am I from? Who am I? I'm a PhD student from Ireland, although I'm currently living in New York. And today, Monday, the 4th of July, is my PhD transfer exam. The transfer exam is not a universal feature to all PhD programs, although it does seem to be quite prevalent in European-based programs. After an appropriate halfway point, you partake in what is called your transfer exam. And the purpose of the transfer exam is to present your research to somebody outside of your supervisory panel, but within your university. And they consider whether your research is valid and has enough within the project to warrant the awarding of a PhD at the end of the program. It's a really useful midway step. It's always valuable to receive feedback from somebody outside of your immediate circle. Of course, because it's also an assessment of sorts, it is accompanied by crippling imposter syndrome. But I've just realized there's very little I can do about that. I think, I'm hoping, that if there were any significant red flags, my supervisor would have flagged them with me already. Um, but again, I could just be, I could just be deluding myself. <laughs> But this is the plan for this morning anyway. I'm gonna take you along. I'm going to have a little bit of breakfast. Uh, bagel Works was open and I grabbed myself a bagel and I made myself a delicious oat milk honey latte because my favorite coffee shop on the Upper East Side, Padoka, is closed today. So I was trying to mimic their piece de resistance. So it's oat milk with instant coffee, honey and brown sugar. And it is very, very good. So yeah, I'm gonna have some breakfast. I'm gonna put on some makeup because I didn't sleep very well last night and I need to hide the anxiety that's manifesting in my visage. I'm going to then carry out some last minute preparation for this uh, exam, which is going to be held over Zoom. I have to give a five to 10 minute presentation on my research and then we have a kind of oral examination. Oh my God, I'm getting really nervous. <laughs> So the assessment's in an hour and a half. I'm gonna put on some makeup. While I'm doing my makeup, I'm just gonna watch YouTube videos to like get out of my head for a little bit. So I will check in with you once once a girl looks a little bit more presentable. Here we go. Okay, I have done my makeup and I'm feeling myself. Probably a bit much for a Zoom exam. But fuck it, it's 4th of July, we're meeting friends later, and it just saves me having to do it again. So, I do need to review my presentation and I need to practice it. Yeah, let's, ha let's do a little bit of presentation work. I came across this really cool feature in PowerPoint, um, which just is really simple and straightforward, but it's kind of leveled up my presentation as a whole. So let me show you that. I, I did dabble a little bit with a Canva presentation, but ultimately I'm still not very familiar with their presentation feature and PowerPoint is just so reliable that I've stuck with that. Um, I wanted to keep it clean, simple, and but also uh, keep a sense of momentum throughout the slides. And one way that I've done that is with the animation feature. No, sorry, the transition feature. And I've applied morph to all of the slides. You can click on the particular transition style that you want and you can also click apply to all up here. What does this transition style do? It identifies a common feature in each of the slides and it uses that to transition between the slides. So this particular shape, it's a really simple shape that I've turned into a side border over here. It's in the colors of my university theme and it features in all of my slides. And look at the effect that is created when I transition from slide to slide. So here's the first one, second one, third one. I really think it makes it slick without trying to be slick and that's how the presentation finishes. So you can see it's super short, but yeah, highly recommend that little feature if you're looking for a way to jazz up your presentations without going overboard. Oh my 
thought that was an hour. Just double checking I signed out. Oh my god. Why was I under the impression that it would be like a five to ten minute chit chat? It was definitely not a chit chat, it was like an hour <laughs> of robust chit chat and actually I'm so much the better for it. It was so like it's just so good to get an extra perspective on your work because you don't know what you don't know. And it's great to have other people point out things to you that you might have missed, but in hindsight are actually very important. So I'm so grateful that they gave me that time to talk about uh, my project. I'm, you know, I'm so much the better for it. That's if I passed, they're talking about me right now. I had to like leave the Zoom meeting room. <laughs> one of the most awkward moments of life. <laughs> I'll just back out virtually. Oh my god, I am sweating because I turned off the aircon. <laughs> really want to eat the end of my bagel, but I don't want poppy seeds in my mouth when I have to sign back into the meeting. Oh god, why did I do that? Fuck it, 50. Fuck, fuck, fuck. So the following um, reflections are obviously based on a very individual experience. That being said, I still think that there's uh, experiences that I can share with you that are also experiences that you might have, or at least you might learn something from them. So these uh, reflections are kind of a bit um, rough and ready, but like I said, I just want to get them out now while, I, while they're still fresh in my mind. So the first thing that I'm feeling after the examination is that is this idea of me being an authority figure now it's funny I think you approach your PhD very much with the student mindset or at least that's what I did I know I still very much have been acting from a place of waiting to be given permission in relation to parts of my project but having been grilled yesterday in my my oral examination I had a super experience of what it is to actually stand up for your research and to feel like you are the one in your, that you are the one in charge here. And the examiner that I had was superb because he asked, he asked the sort of questions that were like provocative, but not, but, but kind of constructively so to really get me thinking about why I made the decisions that I made. And I think that the sooner that you can allow yourself to take that place of authority in relation to your project, perhaps the more your identity as a researcher will be consolidated. Good writing, I think, goes a long way. And I was absolutely delighted. And I'm blowing my own trumpet here because I am trying to acknowledge the good and more critical or constructive critical parts of, of the experience. But um, the examiner did open my examination with the following comment. He said, the report contained excellent writing. You, you have an excellent writing ability. The quality of the writing was very high. And I was absolutely chuffed to get that because back on the 2nd of June, and I have it here in my journal, I have the examiner's name. I was doing some visualizing work and I, I actually wrote down in a quote that I wanted to hear from the examiner, you write extremely well. I take great pride in writing well, I think, because I've never been the strongest writer, I've seen it as a weakness of mine and I'm delighted that it's improving. And in relation to that, I think if you can wrap your head around writing well, writing will really help your project in two main ways. One, writing is a form of thinking. So the more you write, the more you can actually tease out what it is you're trying to do. Because thoughts, when they're in your head, just remain abstract and unstructured. And it, when you put them into words on paper or onto a document in your laptop, you really start to see what the parameters of your project are, what your motivation for the project is, why you're making the decisions that you're making. So that is one benefit of, of really leaning into the writing process. And then the second benefit of leaning into the writing process is 
if you know how to structure a sentence and structure a sentence within the context of a paragraph and construct a paragraph within the context of a section of a chapter and so on and so forth, that actually is how you create your thesis. So I published a video on how to, you know, tips learned from the writing process last week. So if that is something that you have been struggling with, um, I share a lot more detail of the writing process and tips I learned from that in that video there. One of the weaker parts of my report and that I was grilled upon in my examination was the theoretical framework or how I'm contextualizing the, the eventual results of the analysis that I'm doing. And I've just gotten a really good quote from my supervisory panel when I brought up that slight concern that I have. And just feeling like, you know, there's always more that I could do to improve my own understanding of research philosophy, research methodology, theoretical frameworks. As somebody coming from a musical project, within a musical research project, things like qualitative and quantitative aren't always the right words to be using or to be throwing around or to be engaging with because a lot of music tr traditional musicological research has been historical based so it's always been coming from the point of view of history and historical theoretical frameworks and how to do research in history so historiography but because there's so much literature that one can consume and you see these words like qualitative and quantitative and case studies and analysis and comparative and case study da 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 it can be very overwhelming because you're like how do i fit my project into these parameters but one of my supervisory panel members said, it's actually incredibly unhelpful to use those words as a starting point. Your starting point should be, what is your research question? And then what analyses will help you? What did she say? How did, can your analysis help your research? No, no, sorry, hold on, my brain is absolutely fried. So she said, you need to consider first, what is your research question? And then lean into that research question and based on the research question, figure out a way of creating an answer. Picking and choosing methods as you need, but ultimately curating your own original path to answering that question. Not relying on existing ones and trying to like fit your project into it. Uh, my main supervisor said, you want to fit a square peg into a square hole. So you are responsible for creating the way you answer your research questions. Don't assume that you'll find answers to how to do that by simply reading other people's dissertations and relying on frameworks that they curated because they were answering a different question to you. What else did I learn? You really need to listen. <laughs> you really need to listen to what your examiner is asking of you um, because I found that the questions were often preceded by commentary, commentary in relation to the decisions that I made, commentary in relation to abstract ideas existing in the field and then the question would follow. Um, but you need to take a lot of things into account. And this probably seems like the fucking most stupid piece of advice ever, but like, it's an intense experience and you need to be paying attention. So, you know, don't just wait for the question. Make sure you're listening to whatever he or she is saying before the question. God, these are so um, hodgepodge. What else? What else? What else? You know, simple things that, you know, were unique to me on the report that I handed in, but also might be applicable to you. And um, you need to make sure that you're referencing at a high level, you know, that you're referencing properly, properly, obviously, using a consistent reference style. You need to also make sure that your report that you hand in is structured well. I think one of the things that I battled with the most when curating this research report for the PhD transfer exam was thinking that I had to have this very polished piece of research finalized. But I'm only halfway through my project, so there's not a lot that has been finalized. But I think I allowed that to cripple me in terms of how I structured my document. And you, you, you can, you can, you can be unfinished in your work, but you can also still structure how you discuss your work well. And um, so bear that in mind. One of the things that the examiner kept coming back to is what is your original contribution of knowledge? And that's terrifying because you're like, oh, what is it? I don't know. And I really have to like, I have two primary, uh, two primary outcomes of my project that I'm hoping will be original contributions of knowledge. The first is a, a catalog that hasn't been produced before. And then the second original contribution of knowledge is a case study of a particular scholar. So I've, I've picked somebody that's never been studied in detail before, I think, so that's original. And um, I'm also looking at, at his children's song collections and they've never been looked at, so that's original. And then I also have to come up with all of the, the way that I approach the analysis, the way that I frame the, the, the frame the analysis and the exploration has to really come out of this new thing. Because I just want the answers quickly, I always like go to the literature and I'm like, where's the answer that I'm looking for? But actually the answer is in me. <laughs> it's 
So yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. God, I feel like I'm waffling. What else, what else, what else, what else? Feel free to take ownership of your research and to push back when you think you're being challenged on certain decisions that you've made. That's, that's the point of these sort of oral examinations. So they're, they're criticizing you and perhaps provoking you with the expectation that you will stand up for your research. You know, there's a, they're kind of doing it not to be malicious. They're doing it out of a very constructive place. I think that's it you guys, if there's any more I'll add them in the comments, but I'm honestly so tired. My final tip is to rest <laughs> after you've had this exam because you would be exhausted. So, um, uh, yes, if you're still here listening to me shite on, thank you so much for spending your time with me. I'm very aware that this is time, when, when I watch vlogs I'm like giving other content creators my time. And I'm acutely aware that you are doing the same if you're still here, so thank you for choosing to lend me 20 minutes of your time. I hope that it has been useful, whatever. I hope it has served you in some way and that uh, your own research is going well. Please do all the things to support this channel. Blatant plug, but um, I'm really um, leaning into a bit more content creation now that I have time over the summer to do so. And any support you can give, uh, if you enjoy my content, goes a long way. Simply booping the like button or clicking subscribe and hitting that bell notification. If you are a super fan, hi mom and dad, you can become a Patreon, the details of which are down below. And they come with a myriad of benefits that I'm still figuring out, but yeah. I'm gonna go lie down for a long time. I'm really looking forward to it. Bye-bye.